Fotograf Festival. 27. září až 3. listopadu v Praze. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for coming. I would like to welcome you for the last uh, discussion panel of this year's Photograph Festival. Uh, I would like to extend my greetings and uh, welcome to our panelists tonight, uh, designer and philosopher Denis Akera, uh, artist Trevor Paglen, uh, philosopher and curator Václav Janoščík, and COT of Avast, uh, Andrzej Vlček. Um, we are going to start with uh, presentations of uh, each of the panelists and uh, then we are going to move to a mutual discussion. Uh, now I would like to give a floor to Andre from Avast because uh, for us it's very important that this uh, discussion panel is happening uh, here and not in, uh, in an art-related uh, institution as we are used to uh, over the course of uh, history of Photograph Festival. And uh, I think that through Andre's perception, we can create very nice uh, contrapunct to what, uh, what Trevor was saying. But uh, I would also like to extend uh, our great thanks to Avast and uh, to Jana, who helped us to set up the whole thing. So thanks a lot. And is yours. Thank you very much. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Greg. Uh, I'm the CTO of Avast um, and um, I've actually been with the company for over 20 years. Um, it's, a, it's an honor to, to host this event. We're quite pleased uh, to learn about it just recently, really only a week ago, and we took the, took the chance really kind of uh, in the last moment crack. I hope everyone's having a good time here. Uh, we love to do uh, events like this in, on our premise. Uh, this building was kind of designed to be uh, you know, friendly to all sorts of meetups and hackathons and uh, you know, other events that, uh, that make sense and that we are happy to endorse. Um, and when I started at the last, I was actually a, like a as a part-time developer, uh, university student um, in 1995. Um, I co-developed the first version of Avast for Windows 95 in the year 1995. So that's a long time ago. Um, and um, then, uh, and the company was, was very small. It's, I mean, this is, a, this is a Czech company that was founded uh, the first version of the product actually uh, you know, was created in 1988. Um, so even before the political changes in the, in the Czechoslovakia. Um, so we'll be celebrating 30 years next year. Um, quite exciting. Um, I've seen most of the uh, growth. Um, where, where, when I started, we were only like seven or eight people. Uh, now we are over 1,500. So that, that's quite uh, a ride. And um, yeah. Uh, I. One thing that I would say is that uh, the mission of the company hasn't really changed. When the first version of, of the product was created in 1988 uh, by our two founders, uh, who are, by the way, still kind of involved and own a good chunk of the company, um, their mission was to protect, basically protect everyone from the bad guys. Uh, and that's what we do still, that's what we believe in. I think it's a big engine uh, for most of our staff our people are fantastic, you're a great team here. And uh, what kind of unites us is this um, kind of never-ending battle uh, with the bad guys. And maybe later this evening we'll be talking who the bad guys actually are, uh, which <laughs> is, I think might have changed quite a bit uh, in those 30 years. Um, now I was kind of, uh, you know, I, I kind of like the uh, presentation very much, especially the part on machine learning and that, you know, those images and uh, deep learning and uh, neural networks, etc. Because um, from the technology perspective, it's really amazing the shift uh, that happened uh, in the last 5, 10, 15 years. Um, now in cybersecurity, I can tell you, I mean, uh, Trevor was talking mainly about image recognition and image, you know, generation, etc. But this exact same paradigm shift is happening also in cyber. 
so 15 years ago, it was all about you know manual analysis of you know some attacks and uh, malware samples, etc. Today, it's all about big data. It's all about machine learning, and um, uh, you know one of the unique things about Avast is that um, uh, we have really grown to the stage where we are the largest uh, supplier of consumer, at least consumer level security solutions on earth today. We've got over 400 million users. And uh, what we kind of realized later is that these 400 million users can be actually super powerful kind of sensors to actually uh, feed uh, and, and fuel our massive machine learning uh, engine. And uh, even though we started this with the free model, with the freemium model back in 2001, when we didn't really have this, you know, it wasn't like an ingenious business idea to, to start. It was kind of, you know, we didn't really have much money for marketing and we were still a very small company. So we thought in order to break out internationally, we would have to do something more revolutionary, like a, uh, you know, something, something different. And so freemium uh, was a way to get there, to get traction. Uh, basically, uh, you know, and, and to fight the traditional incumbents in the space who had paid only solutions. But then later on, we kind of realized that the true power of that uh, massive user base isn't necessarily just as a kind of marketing vehicle for us, but it's also the data uh, that we can use that kind of fully anonymized, aggregated, etc. but still security data that we can collect. And that really give us this uh, very, unique competitive edge uh, that we, we kind of see everything that happens on the internet from that very end point. Um, and that's, that's really exciting. That kind of gives us uh, capabilities that, uh, that no, one, no one else has in, in the space. And um, yeah, when, when I saw the, you know, the generated images of you know, the um, demon of capitalism and um, charge and whatnot you know, appeared to me we should create an image of a, like an like a arc, arc, archetype of a virus uh, and attack like I mean somehow visualize that would be quite interesting. Uh, now one thing that Trevor I think didn't say is that uh, in order to make machine learning work you really have to have tons of input. That is it really re uh, it relies on massive amounts of data that you have to feed into the engine. Now, when Google and, and, and the big guys, uh, you know, started this image recognition, they really needed not millions, but billions of pictures. I mean, if you are to create a machine learning algorithm that's able to recognize a cat or a shark or something like that, you really have to feed, you know, hundreds of millions of images of cats. It's all different, you know, and then it will start working. And the same thing is happening also in cyber. Like, it, it won't work unless you have really strong sources of data. And this is really where we excel because of that massive user base. So that's great. One last thing about uh, privacy. When we started, again, talking about viruses, malware, et cetera, security was a big thing. But now the uh, very interesting emergent segment for us is privacy, uh, privacy online. And it's, uh, it's kind of interesting the, uh, to, to, to observe the, the switch or the change in customer behaviors, um, also how they are kind of split geographically, like how, how much people do or don't care about privacy on the internet. And we find it almost like counterintuitive. There is things that we would think are kind of no-brainer to protect against, etc. Many people ignore or don't see uh, and just totally, you know, uh, you know, are fine with. Uh, and then there are some other, you know, subtleties that, you know, like for example, you know, tracking uh, of the like uh, retargeting in the advertisement space really kind of piss people, piss people off. And so, I mean, it's like interestingly, of course, as a, as a commercial company, we try to come up with solutions that address problems that, that people perceive as, as you know, as, as pertinent to them. And, uh, but besides that, it's kind of interesting to compare also. Like, for example, there is this, uh, earlier this year, there was this pretty big thing in the U.S. Uh, when um, Trump basically uh, uh, recalled or uh, you know rolled back a law that uh, came into effect under the Obama administration, which had to do with uh, the internet service provider tracking of people's usage of the internet. That is, under Obama, there was a law that basically uh, you know disallowed any ISP internet service provider from using the usage uh, the, the you know the 
um, web usage data uh, for you know commercial purposes. And then one of the first things that Trump did was to basically roll back to 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 recall that 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 bill. And um, that was a pretty big thing for you know many activists in like EFF and, 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 and many other you know groups on the internet, even though may not have kind of reached the general public, but we actually tried to you know build a few marketing campaigns against that to basically promote our privacy products, our encryption, uh, Trevor talked about Tor, our take on it, and probably much more user friendly and kind of easier to use is something that usually called VPN that we have a better kind of big investments in. But it doesn't really matter. It's all about encryption and about kind of privacy. And we were kind of trying to you know use that um, uh, uh, to, to that change to promote that product and to somehow raise awareness that privacy is, a, is, a, is an important thing. And uh, we're kind of, you know, one, ane one anecdote I would like to say is that when we, when first we ran the campaign only in the US and we kind of had all the facts, you know, the evidence, like all the coverage, um, we had a lot of, you know, links to the, uh, to the press uh, that, that covered that, uh, that, that thing. And, uh, didn't work very well in the US, I have to say. Like most people who didn't care, even though we tried to be as transparent as possible. And I mean, we had all these, you know, uh, almost like patriotic, I would say, note in the campaign, and, you know, with the American flags, etc. Now we, we took the same campaign and we ran it in Germany, including the American flags. It worked wonders. Like it's, um, so it's really amazing to see how the perception of the problem varies country by country. I mean, you see, Totally different, um, you know, um, reception of, of, of that same thing uh, around the globe. And I think that will probably uh, become even bigger as we move forward because, you know, the local um, um, habits or, or, or local, you know, tolerances. I would say for, for things like that vary and will continue to vary. Okay, so uh, that's it from me. I think I'll pass it to the next speaker here. So what is hacking? This is something from June this year that I was working on with some people in Tel Aviv and uh, uh, Athens. And it's basically yogurt making. One of the most interesting things you can do is basically to try to do like these hunts for a special type of lactic bacteria that are not commercially available. So I was running um, around and picking up carob tree spots because I found some old legends about Palestinian uh, shepherds making yogurts from these carobs and also some other legends from the Balkans. So I was interested can we make like some new types of products, cheese or yogurt, from bacteria we don't know about? So this is a typical thing. For me, this type of a biohacking or food hacking actually started not in the West, as for most people, because they learn something about technologies there, but actually in Indonesia, where I think this is one of the brilliant definitions of how I understand hacking. And it is an organization called House of the Natural Fiber, and they set up a fab lab where in 2012, we actually turned one of these um, uh, food, uh, food trucks, which are present everywhere in Indonesia on the streets, that's how people get food, and we turned it into something between a science laboratory or a food laboratory, and we were running some molecular gastronomy uh, experiments with verification. We used local wines, and we made these like gelatinous types of uh, um, gels and so on. So also this presentation is a bit my tribute to a friend who recently died, Tommy, and who, who is the guy up there and who represents something about, I would say it's many or communities in the global south that are doing these practices of hacking, making DIY tools and so on, and we simply don't perceive it or we think they do it because they don't have the expensive tools and so on. But uh, it's not true. Like most of the communities I hang out around uh, Southeast Asia or Nepal and other places, they don't want to just catch up things that are happening in the West. They're doing radical things and um, this is the definition they have of their practices. HONF, which is the name of their organization, it could be used as a verb or as a, a noun. It's one who gets excited about things that no one else cares about. And, and you would be surprised, but for example, in Nepal, uh, last year we ran a workshop where people were building nanosatellites. 
and they really want to start a space program. So, uh, okay. And another thing about Indonesia, it's probably the only place in the world where you will see the DIY sign on banks and government buildings, and it is like the DIY republic of the, of the world, because DIY actually means something autonomous regions of uh, Jakarta in Bahasa, Indonesia. So they have this DIY in their genes. So my understanding of what hackers and hacking means, or the perspective I take upon that, is maybe well summarized by this quote by Nicolas Bourriot, a famous curator of contemporary art, or conceptual art mainly. And I really like this quote where he says, basically, you never know where ideas come from. I believe in chaos for answers. And the most important thing today, when our tastes are calculated by algorithms, is to find things that you are not looking for. And that, later, he defines as actually being alive. So how do I, how do I interpret it, and how, where do I search these funny ideas? So I try to, to, do, to go back into practices and um, to use tools which are forgotten, so I often go back into history of science, or in this recent project we started in Arizona this year, we created actually tarot cards. <laughs> uh, tarot cards for science and technology controversies. And here is something related to our topic. This is the interpretation of the fool, because the fool is actually in this tarot card system, a person that doesn't know where he goes. Or it's basically, he's finding things that he's not really looking for. So we made like a new version of the fool. Um, you see the definition there. So behind the anonymous mask, is it a fool, a joker, or a troll? Is it someone diving into the deep wisdom outside the technology, or someone drowning in the deep, into the deep web? Is he a neo-ludite, cyber criminal, or hacktivist? So all of the 22 cards, we made like some new interpretations, put some new symbols. It's pretty simple. It's online, you can use it. And we were doing like tarot card readings. They were not very personal. We were trying to do like some form of a game, like people would pick up two cards and we would ask them to create a scenario of what they think it's gonna happen. By the way, we also tried the machine learning thing and we found out the data sets are really pathetic it's because our idea was, yeah, we can put like images and, and then something can read like what is inside. Um, this project developed into a further phase where we were trying to actually put some of the technologies we talk about on the cards. So I'll just play the video so you get some idea because it relates to technology I'm really excited about and it is uh, microfluidics, let's see. Oops, I forgot to warn them uh, that there is a sound, but it doesn't matter, you can read it, what I'm saying there. Basically, microfluidics is this future lab on a chip technology that everyone is excited about because it lets you do uh, cheaper science experiments and also um, work like with chemicals and samples on a cheaper and um, easier level. So we actually developed for the project a microfluidics chip on a wax printer. So the channels are made of wax and we were connecting it with like real circuits, making this little funny uh, lab on a chip thing which turns on an LED. So I don't think it's anything useful yet, but it was fun to work on it. And for me, it was like moving this idea of the tarot cards, not only into graphic work, but also into kind of prototyping, and again, asking these important questions. Once we have this real-time data about our bodies, and, um, and we can even stream this data in real time, what will happen? Who will own the data? How to make, uh, how to make such practices with data uh, kind of safe and, uh, um, and fair? So let me get back, so this doesn't... Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, I'm kind of obsessed with this biodata. And this was also the origin of my interest in these makers, hackers, and so on, because back in 2010, I visited Boston at a conference for consumer genomics data. I was interested in it as a, as a designer, basically, like thinking about how do we design some biosocial connections between people that have similar type of genes and so on. And of course, I feel very ambivalent also about uh, uh, these data. Uh, this is, for example, some of my DNA profiles on 23andMe, which you could get this before. Now you cannot get this type of 
uh, services anymore. You, you have to get the raw data and get them interpret somewhere. And I actually got like quite a lot of data over the time. And it's not just the DNA, but uh, this is, for example, microbiome data. This is uh, for my kit. Uh, there's some, I will not go into the information, what they say. I just want you to get some feeling about these services and availability of data. I even have my brain data. <laughs> and this data fetishism over the year um, produced, one of the projects was that here in Bermelab, which is a local Prague hacker space, we, were, we run like one of the first, let's say, DNA-based dinners. So we created like meals based on the genetic profiles of two people at that time that had this data. And maybe the funny part, so we used a couple of interesting genes to create the meals, but as you see, we spent most of the time actually watching what that means rather than really eating. Uh, one of the things that was fun during the dinner, uh, people in the place would get different amount of alcohol depending on what was uh, their scores for alcoholism. So I got the full amount because I'm, I have just typical lots of alcoholism. <laughs> We'll check that. And then I got obsessed with this question, so what do I do with all this data I own now and all these profiles? And some of uh, like 23 and me didn't feel so comfortable anymore because they actually take your data and then patent some insights and uh, research they got from that. So I started worrying about it and then it was the time for all these blockchain technologies. So some of the experiments I ran over these years was rethinking is there a model that I put my data on the blockchain and you know it doesn't actually work but that brought me to the project I'll talk about where my interest in uh, all these microfluidic lab on a chip technologies and uh, DNA data connected in a funny way so a few years ago I was at a friend in Switzerland who developed this tool called OpenDrop that's also what you saw with that channels, but it does it on an electric field. It can put molecules of liquids together and you know, you can even play like a punk on it. And um, I got this idea, you know, we can connect actually the Bitcoin and do some form of a lab automatization. So this is, uh, I'll just play the video. We will not have the sound, so I'll try to say what's going on there. Basically the idea was to give, this is the organism on, um, on a microscope and we created the Bitcoin account for this uh, thing and we named her or it, I don't know, BT Daphnia. It's a Daphnia zooplankton. You feed fish with that. So BT Daphnia was the first zooplankton with the Bitcoin account and on one name and the, <laughs> the model was a smart contract basically. If people send us enough Bitcoins or some, you know, something, We'll just uh, connect uh, the microscope to this um, to this uh, open drop microfluid, uh, microfluidics plate, and we will uh, we will let the Daphne perform basically dance on on this uh, on this tool, and um, so. It, it was a form of a smart contract. It was a form of, you know, how do you to do crowdsourcing or crowdfunding for science, how to communicate science maybe. But this gets me to the last thing I'll present today and where I am now. Oops, it's moving somewhere. You can still send us money, of course, on BT. Uh, uh. Yeah, so this is my latest project where I'm looking more into the what does it mean to make a smart contract and all these blockchains? Sorry for people that don't know enough about this. I will not go into it. But think of it as an internet with the history. Basically, all these distributed ledger technologies and blockchains are very slow internet or a network which builds itself by evolving, by making the transactions on the ledger as part of, it, of its layers. So I decided, okay, all this data I have, my bio data and everything, what can I do with that? So I decided let's do the uh, last will, like a testament or what is often called also the death switch in terms of the smart contracts. And uh, I'm working on a project where I'm putting on the blockchain my last will on Ethereum platform as a form of a contract where in the moment when I die, all my data will go to my partner, all the ether I have also, but there will be also little performance where I hope to achieve that uh, a part of a Plato dialogue will be read on the Ethereum platform. 
So that's it. I'm actually curious in these smart contract things and all this cryptography behind it because it's, it's trying to achieve something that we know from magic. It tries to achieve that um, something will be um, uh, done automatically. So that's completely the opposite of what contracts do or what our politics does where we are trying to create an agreement between wills or we cry, try to create institutions that observe what is going on. Uh, with, um, with these smart contracts, we are automatizing certain like social institution or cer certain uh, even behaviors. So the Spacia script here, it's a bit like description of what it will do. It is Ethereum based last will. Uh, if the contract isn't touched by creator's vital data, uh, originally I thought it will be from a wristband. Now I'm working with a microcontroller called uh, Particle. And um, I see it basically as a form of this, what was used to be called Pax with the Devil, where impossible transactions were possible suddenly, and there was always some part of your body, usually objected part of your body, like blood or something involved. So it reminds me a little bit of, around this, but also this promises that it's some form of a magic that gives you this power to connect everything. And that's my last slide. I hope I'm not, you know, overdoing this, um, what, why I'm doing this smart contract, I call it a Spacia smart contract because the things which will be read on Ethereum is a famous Spacia speech from Plato's Menexenos dialogue that opens this, idea, that opens this question of what is the proper way to celebrate the dead soldiers or what is the proper way to talk basically about uh, death and it opens many interesting issues for me as a philosopher around actions and words and now I look into these hashes that are happening on the blockchain as a very strange object. So I see it as my personal pact with the devil, something of a techno-political ritual, maybe a philosophical dialogue, rethinking my identity and all this data I generate on the blockchain. What does it mean to be dead on the blockchain is maybe one of the important questions. And are we really uh, free citizens or we are something else? Are we becoming slaves when all our data are owned and traded these ways? Or are we something in the, which is something in the middle and it's uh, something that keeps me interested in this topic very much is the Roman concept of nexus or nexum, which is someone who has a debt, but it's much, much more uh, complicated. So that's all, thank you. Um, what I'm gonna do is actually to turn, uh, I, I completely changed my mind. I'm not gonna really <laughs> talk about myself, hopefully, but I'm gonna talk about speculative history and the history of corporations because it really uh, somehow affected me when I even entered this very um, ambience, this very building. And I really want to, yeah, I really want to somehow exploit the, the fact that I'm here and I'm um, having the opportunity to talk to you from, from this particular point. But anyway, um, I still really to just uh, say a few words. I, I teach at, on the art schools here on Prague. They are very peculiar institutions with very peculiar problems that uh, I definitely won't really talk about. But in a backdrop, uh, there's going to be this kind of dissatisfaction from my part uh, with this uh, academic background that we have here in Prague and uh, the very concept of like speculative history tends to be uh, a response uh, to my disillusionment, my growing dissatisfaction from the academic and theoretical and philosophical practice here and uh, my, my sort of proposition what to do next. So speculative history out of, uh, out of uh, <laughs> the presence. Why, why actually um, uh, speculative maybe? Because we know that uh, speculation has been really stirred up in contemporary art a lot and a lot. It has been recycled over and over, but it's basically tied to the future because we naturally speculate about what's going to happen. We don't really speculate about what has had happened already. But uh, I want to take this lesson from, from the future-based art or future-oriented art and still get it back uh, to history because history is not really the objective thing that we have may, may have learned in our you know, secondary uh, schools, but history is actually this abundant, uh, thick space of you know, uh, meanings and ethics, uh, and we can really dissect, we can really diverge, we can pick 
from that history in order to actually build up our presence and maybe even to like eject ourselves into the future. So that's why the turn to actual history, sorry. Uh, what I'm gonna do in terms of <laughs> in terms of uh, corporations, I really want to outline these five principles, these five pillars of what do I consider to be a uh, corporation as it's historically, you know, founded. And uh, we're gonna do this uh, brief, brief detour through the long course of history. This is uh, Thales, one of the first, uh, you know, first known philosophers. Although the, first, the word philosophers was actually not really happening at his time. But anyway, he's important not only because of his metaphysical speculations, but why? Uh, but because uh, his, uh, you know, ontology is actually tied up to economical things. Uh, he, by certain legends, is considered to be the first speculator because uh, he was trying to persuade his fellow uh, citizens of Miletos in today's uh, Turkey that actually the value of things is not u universal but it's really meant to be decided on the market. So what he did, he uh, actually uh, did, did this speculation or he, he owned, uh, he, he acquired all the uh, olive oil fields and next year the olive oil, the, the price of olive oil actually is like plummeted up and that's how he uh, even uh, made uh, the fellow citizens to think about the value of philosophy maybe that's what we're gonna do but anyway it's the first pillar that I would designate as an ex exchange so exchange as the first principle that somehow gives rise to uh, the need of corporations the second one is depersonalization and there we have to go to uh, of course the roman empire and the, particularly the roman law because that's the that's the phase or that's the point where really this uh, idea of having an entity that is liable, that is, that is able to act, uh, comes from. And this very entity is, of course, n uh, not only the sum of the individuals, it's not reducible to any of these individuals, but it's happening, it's living, it's going on and it makes difference, like, uh, for instance, Populus Romanus or Universitas as a, as a body, as a corpus. So the very idea of, you know, having like unbodied body. But anyway, uh, the third principle, uh, the, first pil the third pillar is actually colonialism and uh, accumulation and exploitation. I don't consider con colonialism only to be part of our history, but actually as a principle of how do we, uh, how do wealth itself accumulates under the, uh, you know, charge of uh, corporations. Uh, the, the year that I would uh, somehow stick our attention to is uh, 1600, where the Elizabeth I actually started East India Company. That's the prototypical, uh, you know, corporation that got the monopoly uh, on the trade with, with the Indias. And that's the proverbial, you know, corporation that had its own army to enforce its interests and all things like that. And it actually started not only this exploitation of, you know, the colonies, but actually it started uh, to affect our thinking, to change the idea of who we are, how do we relate to others through exchange, through trade. So that's why we have mercantilism, that's the idea that we have to, uh, you know, get raw materials uh, and then sell goods because we then get money and our national wealth is secured and stuff like that. Then we have classical neoliberalism and laissez-faire economy like in upcoming centuries that really, uh, I can reduce them to the point of being of uh, the fact that this uh, economical dealings are best, uh, best done with when there's no intrusion of the public and when the corporations themselves, you know, mingle in at the market. And that's how actually, uh, or that's loosely connected to what we call neoliberalism from, let's say, the half, second half of the uh, 20th century. And that's maybe going to be my question or my task. How, how the hell we got to neoliberalism? But anyway, 19th century, uh, fourth pillar, identity, particularly visual identity. We know that the uh, 19th century really brought us so many like uh, in interesting inventions and one of them was actually paid advertisement. This is uh, 1836 uh, La Presse, uh, the first papers that were really run on the basis of paid advertisement. 
uh, what the papers did actually, and what is really covered by our historians, is uh, the growth of nationalisms and all sorts of you know en enlightenments and resurgimentos and things like that. We know that particularly well from the Czechoslovak history, but. Um, uh, what, uh, for instance, Be uh, Benedict Anderson uh, um, did, uh, he coined this phrase, imagine communities, uh, in, in, a, in a very title of his most important book, where he claimed that actually all these nations are somehow, you know, artificial communities, communities of the, you know, of the people who are reading the papers. Uh, who are reading the same, or who are having the same channels of information and therefore can somehow act you know, in, in accordance, can act as communities or even public corporations. So wh what I wonder about is why don't we apply the same logic to private corporations and not only nations? So I think that again advertisement uh, has like a very incredibly instrumental role in creating the idea of something uh, something beyond an uh, individual human being having an agency, having a will, having an interest. Okay, in this crazy, super quick uh, detour to 21st, uh, sorry, 21st century, that there's the fifth principle and that's the automation or the ma ma machine inside corporations. Uh, there I resort to the year 1913 where uh, Henry Ford finally uh, you know, uh, made perfect his assembly line for the Model T vehicle. It's not only uh, some peculiar story about you know, uh, automobilism, but it's actually a great event in terms of affordability and mobilization of the whole population and of, of our imagination. Just the very fact that uh, the, uh, this very vehicle was not meant for any kind of nobility. Actually, it was quite well uh, advertised for the, for the very laborers that were working at this factory. And they were at this time able for, for only four uh, month wages, they were able to purchase this Model T vehicle. So from that moment, it was, uh, you, you, do, you don't actually have to, you know, take uh, a horse ride or like a walk around uh, your neighborhood, but you can take a car or you, you can take the ride and uh, that completely revolutionized our sense of uh, what is space and what is time and what, what can we do with the time uh, in terms of our transportation. And it really, uh, you know, made us face so many different uh, cultural backgrounds, geographical situations or even uh, ideas. So therefore we finally get into the 20th century and uh, what I would try to say in following, let's say four, maybe three, maybe five minutes is like this theory of 20th century. The question that I would pose is really how to well we, did we get here? How, how did it, uh, what did it take so that uh, corporations from the beginning of 20th century really got this sort of power? So that the proverbial uh, saying of uh, Alessio Restani uh, it goes like uh, governments don't rule the world, Goldman Sachs rules. Uh, that's how he actually explains the, uh, not only the crisis of 2008, but mainly the response to the crisis of 2008. But anyway, so let's get back to this uh, small 20th century. I, I don't want to actually f uh, focus on the corporations themselves, because what I think took place is actually a more larger, more, you know, uh, historical, uh, cultural change or change in our imagination, in our thinking. So I think we need to trace that in order to understand why the corporations Anyway, 2008, again, we have the T model here because it has been invented or first fabricated in 2008, the very same year as Filippo Marinetti uh, wrote, uh, was already writing his uh, Manifesto of Futurism. Uh, it's the year where even <laughs> a vacuum cleaner, uh, very symptomatical thing for me, ha has happened because uh, SO as uh, Model T Ford. Uh, somehow democratizes uh, transportation in the very same way vacuum cleaner uh, somehow democratizes the, the care we take about surroundings, about our households and things. It's no longer like, you know, the 
the, the noble class that, uh, that has us, you know, the poor people to take care of their households, but it's uh, all of us having households that, that must be kept clean. And uh, the modern idea of, you know, keeping things clean, of uh, modern idea of what is hygiene and what is disciplination, that's closely tied to mechanization of our households. Anyway, that's again the year where uh, <laughs> the annexion of Bosnia Herzegovina happened, and you know that actually that is what triggered the great war. I'm gonna jump quickly to the 60s because particularly all these political events I don't think they are so much interesting in, to, in terms of corporations but what has been started in 2000 uh, sorry in 1908 what has been somehow released with the futurist manifesto with all those uh, great inventions is a certain idea of time is a certain <coughs> idea of having like a horizon of expectation of having future that we can somehow step in future that we can struggle with and like future pro uh, future society that we can get into a tap into hack into in order to create uh, the world more just or more uh, more beautiful or more good but anyway this sort of uh, efforts i would claim uh, somehow uh, reached its pinnacle or pi uh, piked uh, into uh, in 1966 which is like this heated year of the 60s uh, you know that uh, Le Mo Le Chance was published the, f the book that I would claim that triggered uh, what we call post-structuralism post-structuralism as the last grand theory that we actually have both in humanities and arts I actually added a Czech example because uh, the seminal work of uh, Radovan Richta and his collective uh, the civilization at crossroads happened there and actually that's the year where uh, briefly John Lennon claimed that uh, the Beatles are more popular than Jesus Christ. Uh, he of course like apologized for that but for me it just simply symbolizes the fact that popular culture is no longer just an addendum, no longer some kind of secondary level of who we actually are but popular culture is what we do. Popular culture is the space where we interact and what we uh, do. Uh, just to skip all other beautiful examples, I'm just going to say that that's the year where Star Trek uh, launched and aired. Star Trek that is basically this kind of communist utopia that we usually forget about because we take you know all those gadgets and action moments from that. But actually, uh, what we need to keep it down is the political political level that is so much different from actually the Star Wars that aired or uh, has been released in, two, uh, in 1977. And what really strikes me, what really bothers me, what the hell happened between uh, 1966 and 1977? Let me get straight to that, like finish in one minute. Uh, that's the year where Charlie Chaplin dies, the embodiment of the capitalism with the human face. There's the Andras Bader who, uh, who con uh, committed suicide in prison. The, again, the embodiment of the violent left, the last hero of the violent left. And that's also the year where, I, I don't really want to play that, but still, the Stranglers, the prototypical pre-punk uh, band uh, sings that there's no more heroes. They ask, uh, they ask what happened to Leon Trotsky, what happened to Shakespeare, what happened to Beethoven, they are dead, there's no more heroes. But there is actually a hero, uh, that is of course uh, David Bowie with uh, the, 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 the single Heroes that has been again released in, at this uh, remarkable year 1977. But it's of course a completely different sense of heroism. It's heroism that is completely stripped out of any, you know, uh, heroic, therefore polish Political value. It's heroism that is entirely self-sustained in this glamorous aura of the pop cultural hero. And then we have the end of this short 20th century. We, we in Czech Republic we are completely focused on the 1989 and we have even this crazy theory of the fa fate of the eighths in 20th century. I, I, I would like to somehow detach myself from that and uh, claim even that we, we, can, we can set the, the end of the 20th century here in 1985. It's, uh, it's the year where Madonna had his, her first global tour, it's the year where uh, Super Mario has been released, it's the year where DNA has been uh, you know, used in terms of uh, criminal prosecution. All these events may seem kind of harmless, but we may even the DNA application to, uh, see as the, the fundamental step uh, in how 
the automation or the you know the machine uh, uh, machine uh, distribution of data or machine uh, application of data can be really used to very, to our very bodies to our agency and things like that. Minolta, for instance, releases maximum 7,000, 7, which is interesting in terms of photography because it was the very first camera that has fully automated you know, focus system. And it really triggered this uh, recording revolution that we now uh, face uh, with uh, Facebook, Twitter, and social media. Anyway, this even matches the feminist uh, movements, uh, but I don't really have the time to get into that. The, let me get really to the point, if there is some, and because I think you're all so much exhausted after all these two hours uh, of information or uh, projects. Uh, there is one thing I resorted to heavily, that's Franco Bifo Berardi and his uh, claim that we actually live in a time without future. We live in a time after future because what happened actually in 20th century has been somehow uh, of a privatization of the future because we know that the uh, data mining and the, uh, the imagination that is tied up to corporations is somehow um, violent in terms of you know acquiring in terms of stepping into the future and catapulting the future back onto our heads in our presence this uh, I can resort to a few <laughs> pop cultural uh, examples uh, it can be you know valent and uh, tyrell corporations from the proverbial blade runner this year it may be Westworld it may be ex machina all the uh, narrations are tying up our future and the, the fundamental question of what is human how does we relate to artificial intelligence how do we relate to the inhuman they tie that to corporate research not to the public research there's nothing like you know the Star Trek utopia you no know, there's only corporations that we can rely on and that's of course uh, how we uh, formulate our uh, like visions the, I, I have sorry I have here like of course Nick Land who started the movement called accelerationism and who really as the only one I, I would claim was trying to somehow uh, acquire the future through acceleration of both capitalism and technology but his fellow pupils and students they uh, released completely different thinking or different responses how to reacquire future how to claim back what we lost let's say even to corporate agency and that is uh, to resist uh, the, the fig that uh, Mark Fisher labels capitalist realism. And what, it, what he actually claims we can do is to use the platforms in our way, to use uh, whatever uh, services do we have at hand, uh, whatever freemiums and sequels and uh, uh, crazy platforms we have, in our advantage to tap into them, to hack into them, in order to somehow get part not only on the present state of affairs, but what happens. And what happens is somehow tied to the platforms. Uh, let me just get to one last point uh, that is uh, that I take from Nick Srinicek's platform capitalism because what he says about the behavior of all the corporations today is that all corporations are getting to be data corporations and what we heard about uh, Avast which I uh, uh, in a way admire is that w w what, what, what we need not only in cyber security but in any sort of business is to work with the data and why because we need to predict because we need to be prepared for the future and uh, what my point what my slight point would be that we can do that uh, not only the corporations oh, sorry for taking so long Okay, so I'm just going to open this panel with one uh, very simple question to all the panelists and then I would like to extend the discussion to the audience. Uh, listening to those presentations, it seems that uh, we have this common uh, topic uh, of uh, uh, very simply put uh, of a bad guy or of, uh, of a villain in our little story. Uh, in Trevor's case, uh, we are talking about all the secret agencies. Uh, Václav uh, ended up with uh, platform capitalism. Uh, Kara has all this uh, overwhelming data. And uh, you and Jay obviously uh, are very closely relating to uh, all the cyber crime, let's say. Uh, 
can you maybe define all of you uh, this this dichotomy or this polarity of uh, of this good and evil thing? This very simple but uh, actually quite uh, layered and complicated uh, content of your work and practices. Let's start with Andre. Can we do that? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> who is the enemy? Uh -huh. Sorry. <coughs> yeah, who, who is the bad guy? So, I mean, look, in, in our view, so what we have been doing basically was detecting, ha has been detecting anomalies in the system. So, we've done some kind of baseline uh, from, a, from a mathematical or computer science perspective. It's all about some kind of baseline looking for anomalies. Um, now, what I think has changed over the 30 years is who actually is responsible for those anomalies. Um, in the beginning, in the 80s, it was actually more like uh, pranksters, uh, you know, I don't know, university students who wanted to break the price to show off that they did something that no one else could do. Um, then, over time, it became more like a, I mean, many people realize that they can actually make living out of creating viruses and uh, you know spreading and you know stealing great effects. So it became sort of an organized crime which grew um, by I mean actually much bigger than most people realize. Um, today most most analysts agree that uh, cyber crime is now bigger in terms of dollars, a uh, bigger problem than drug trafficking and human trafficking combined. So it is actually the largest, single largest category of crime to, today in existence. So that you've got I mean, hundreds of thousands of millions of people in this world who kind of are involved in this and who, who kind of do it for money. Um, and then probably um, in the last five years, maybe slightly longer, uh, it became also a pretty practical way for nation states, governments, um, either demo democratic or non-democratic, doesn't really matter, or for that matter, um, a, a, a means of sort of, you know, doing whatever they need or want to do. Um, and plus, I mean, all sorts of activism, all sorts of activism, etc. So it's a big mess. And it's, a, it's a kind of melting pot of all sorts of uh, you know, people who have different motives and different interests. And from our perspective, it's kind of interesting because um, you know, we don't really distinguish, uh, like that is the systems that we build you know, don't really distinguish what the motives are. I mean, in a way, lucky uh, being back here in a country which is not very involved, shall we say, globally, politically, or, you know, in surveillance, or I don't even know whether this country has an army, or, uh, you know, an intelligence unit, etc. It doesn't seem, at least from our, I can tell you, we haven't been asked to cooperate with, you know, uh, check intelligence, if something like that exists. Um, <laughs> and so it gives us a, a, an interesting angle, which, I mean, we didn't earn in this kind of uh, I can imagine that many of our, you know, peers or competitors, maybe especially those coming from the U.S. or from the other side, like uh, uh, Russia or China, they are under some some kind of uh, pressure from their local governments to, you know, cooperate, and that doesn't necessarily just mean, uh, you know, pass information, but it can actually mean proactively cooperate in terms of surveillance, in terms of whitelisting the tools that the government has put in place uh, to, uh, to, you know, again, to do whatever they need to do, um, etc. So, um, yeah, I mean, for, for us, it, it's, it's been quite a, quite a, you know, a lucky coincidence that we're right here. But um, I don't think uh, you can say that about most other security companies. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I actually don't think of like the, the NSA per se of, like as an enemy in that way. I mean, like I don't, I guess I don't think about it in terms of, I, I think about it in terms of 
what kind of society do you want to live in and what are forces that want to work against that, you know, or, or that structurally have to work against that, right? I mean, like, so my problem with the NSA isn't that, like, there's, like, a government surveillance agency, like, it's that it is a multi-billion dollar government surveillance agency doing things completely um, that are, you know, are breaking laws in secret, and it's, it's a kind of, it's, a, it's structurally a profoundly anti-democratic Hmm. part of the state, right? And so it, it's kind of set up in such a way that it's consolidating certain kinds of state powers in certain sectors without any accountability, without hmm. any oversight. And I think that was very clearly illustrated by um, a lot of this noted stuff. And so that on one hand, but then on the other hand, I think about, you know, interests, you know, this kind of coupling of technology and capital, which is, of course has always been the case, but you know, the real business model of, a, of an entity like a Google or like a Facebook or of machine learning or artificial intelligence in the first place, but the goal here is to make money, right? Like that is what <laughs> is going on. And in a way, it's, it's not so different than classical automation, like Fordism or building assembly lines or something like that. But what what is different qualitatively is the ability to bring ever smaller and ever more intimate aspects of our everyday lives within a kind of logic of capital. And then you see that in a lot of different domains. So for example, the sharing photos on Facebook, I think is a good example of that. I mean, like sharing pictures of your children is literally one of the most intimate things that you can share with the rest of the world. And so I worry about the fact that that very intimate detail of human lives then becomes kind of vacuumed into giant metadata signatures that are being created about everybody that for their whole life. You know, and like it's definitely at the point where Google knows more about you than you know about you. You know, <laughs> and and so that that kind of bringing these parts of life that were previously not subject to a market logic into a market logic mm. is something that I think is at odds with a greater idea of like having a kind of democratic society with like equal rights and liberties and that sort of thing. So that's on one hand. And you see that in other domains as well in terms of you know, automation, on, on one hand automation of labor, but then on the other hand the ability to um, uh, break ever smaller moments of of the working day, you know, to, to granularize labor processes, like if you look at things like Starbucks, where they'll have a workforce, or where you come in for like half an hour in the morning and then 45 minutes in the evening, because if the ability to do that to um, control time has gotten more and more granular and more and more fine tuned. I think that that comes at the expense of security, honestly, like you mean, in terms of being able to make a living or feed itself or clothe itself. So I guess those are the, the kinds of things that I worry about in, in the overall picture. So it's not enemies per se, it's yeah. the system, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, that goes very nice to get to our thoughts. I don't want to like, evade the question, it's like a beautiful question because it's the fundamental good and the evil the generate uh, idea of what, what, what yes. But precisely, you know, that may be like the seduction of, of this uh, neutralization of what, what do we do when we try to act in a good way or in an evil way. But anyway, uh, uh, moving beyond that, uh, what, what I'm interested in is actually agency, you know, and I, I don't mean quite NSA, but uh, I mean agency as our human ability to actually even orient our, uh, the very fact of orientation of, uh, among all those complex issues we face today or you know, you know to uh, have at least uh, uh, some say or some do in respect to what is actually being happening with our world so 
that's how I uh, even imagine the platforms. Uh, they are not just, you know, your timeline on Facebook, but platform is a space that enables or affords a certain action. That's, and that's what we need to somehow dissect. That's what we need to uh, imagine and maybe even reimagine for the sake of our future. But just to be, uh, just to answer really more clearly, what, what, what I think Trevor does with, uh, with uh, the vision uh, regimes and surveillance and what I believe even Denisa does with in terms of biohacking and uh, if you permit me certain audacity and if I may be bold enough what I what am trying to do with theory as a language as, as a means of uh, communication of ideas uh, is to hack into that platform or to, to you know diverge uh, the rolling tendencies uh, among those platforms and to really rewire them for the sake of the individual. Mm. I was thinking uh, what, what is the enemy for me in all these projects that I was involved in. Um, I, I think it's uh, just, a, just a matter of freedom, like what allows you to do most experiments try new things, actually get out of the system, even if you can seem politically naive. Or, I don't know, for me, the experience of being outside of that Western world is suddenly also liberating. Kind of get out of the dichotomies you usually use when you think about the world, and being open to spaces, geographically and in every sense, that allow you to do something else. I mean, that would tie maybe to my question, um, could you maybe elaborate, but maybe after other people talk, uh, what do you see as the connection between this corporate power and the power of these um, government agencies that are out of control <laughs> and some, let's say, actors of Russia or some countries with ill intents that are hiring hackers and so on. Do we even know nowadays what is the landscape of these evil actors or actors that are trying to take too much power over our data, lives, money, uh, political freedoms. Do we even know actually what is the landscape nowadays? I would love to hear your thoughts about it. I mean, certainly over the course of having kind of worked on going from looking at NSA stuff and I think I started to not think about them as separate in a way. Like I, you know, I think about them as various, you know, that kind of gradient within a, you know, on a common infrastructure, right? That, that, that there's certain places where their political goals align and places where they don't. But for example, you can sure, like Google has much more data than the NSA has, for example, right? But Google is also subpoenaable, right? In other words, like the police can go to Google and get whatever the hell they want, right? And so, in that sense, those those distinctions between like what state power, what's like corporate power, start to get very blurry, right? In, and in terms of like the influence of like data collection on your everyday life, on, on your everyday life, it's, you're probably in much greater danger of having the, your personal security destabilized by a platform like a Facebook or something like that than by an NSA. Because if you let's say Facebook it has pictures of your children or something like that and then is able to figure out that your children are sick pretty often. Maybe that information gets sold to the health insurance company that is going to modulate your premiums based on that. Maybe the fact that you don't go to the gym as much as you should gets sold to somebody who's going to, again, modulate insurance based on that. Maybe Apple is able to, they can do this today, detect that, oh, you went to a bar for five hours and then you drove home. Does the police automatically, do they, does the police have this, Apple have a subscription service where police get flagged when that kind of behavior happens. These are very easy things to imagine and are, can very directly kind of affect your everyday life. Um, we are talking about forms of uh, power from independent positions of academia and artistic practice, uh, but we are sitting in an office of, uh, of a corporation. Maybe uh, 
Andre, you can tell us a bit more about uh, forms of uh, usage of this power which you which you have from this position. I was told at the beginning that uh, we are going to have this demo of uh, of, of of this Wi-Fi. Uh, uh, software that we are going to be able to connect to to Wi-Fi, uh, free Wi-Fi at this space, and at the end uh, uh, we'll be confronted with uh, kind of a surveillance of what we were doing on the internet through this Wi-Fi. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. Uh, but I mean, these are the possibilities among many others which uh, Avast can actually afford. So I would wonder. How this works for you? Sure. <laughs> well, I, I think it's actually two things on the other question where, you know, for, and there's been a few like I've spent one of the topics here which we plan, uh, you know, kind of combined through um, pretty much all the talks today, um, you know, that our corporation, that is where, you know, the evolution. Um, from the humble beginnings to today's um, belief by many that uh, it's not the politicians or it's not the, uh, the government that, uh, that you know, control the world in corporations. Uh, and then the second, the, the practical kind of aspects of what is kind of the, the state of the art or what is possible for not just the government or corporation, but also for, you know, any hacker, any white hacker or Black, like the hacker, uh, for that matter, what is possible. Uh, I'm probably uh, it's easier for me to comment on the on the latter, uh, being very techy myself. Um, what I can tell you is, uh, you know, yeah, uh, like uh, probably why I was quite evil. You would be surprised uh, how dangerous or how simple it is for someone who knows what what he is doing to. You know, basically see everything that you use. Like if you go here, here, and here, if you if we have this, uh, you know, uh, Avas Wi-Fi, or if you go here over the street to Starbucks or to McDonald's, connect to the Wi-Fi, um, you can, you know, be pretty sure that uh, either someone sitting um, kind of at the table next to you or Starbucks itself sees what um, what you are doing. Um, even in, um, you know, uh, in, in many cases, even for sites that you know are the stage to DPS, that is the encrypted site, it's not, um, in, in many cases, and there's some exception, in many cases, it's not that difficult to get into the stream and to at least, um, you know, tag, uh, let's see what's happening there, block everything that you do in, in more spaces, modify what you are doing. So, I mean, one thing that I wouldn't do is do any kind of sensitive you know, transactions on public Wi-Fi whatsoever. I like, can forget about banking or shopping or uh, interacting with your anonymity or records, etc. It's really dangerous. But what's probably even, uh, I mean, scarier and most people don't recognize it is that for um, for wireless connections, like on um, your phone, of course, if you connect through a Wi-Fi or it connects through the 4G, 3G signal, and it's not that difficult and expensive to build a fake 3G, 4G tower. Uh, we actually have some in this building also. <laughs> uh, that um, uh, you know somehow trick your phone into connecting to the tower instead of the official one, and uh, then you get the same thing. Um, it is uh, slightly less scalable because the equipment that you use uh, for this is, um, say, um, single thousands of dollars as opposed to the Wi Fi where you need basically, I mean, all you need is equipment in tens of dollars uh, to do that, but that's the total cost of one. It is being used, uh, especially in high concentration uh, areas like. Let's say uh, sports stadiums, um, you know, public venues, etc. It's quite common these days, and it, um, yeah, it kind of opens all sorts of. It just kind of, I mean, it really uh, is. Uh, I would say uh, most people, I mean, don't don't even you know think about these things, but uh, you need to kind of you know think about just a little bit uh, about what the consequences can be. 
And where it is, like, I mean, all this stuff is relatively new, and then, I mean, what happens in 5, 10, 20 years, uh, when the internet becomes totally ubiquitous, and, you know, it's kind of like, it becomes some sort of an oxygen for, for humans, an extension of the brain, you have kind of instant access to anything and everything that's online. Uh, but then, I mean, in, in a world where, at the same time, it can be somehow manipulated and, you know, modified, um, uh, at various levels, it's, it's, it's a pretty scary picture, if you ask me. Um, so again, I mean, our mission here is to come up with solutions that somehow help humans, like our mortals, consumers, uh, end users, not, not companies or corporations, but predominantly um, end users to basically um, protect themselves and, and somehow, I mean, as, as we say, it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, it, it has to be just better than kind of the person that's sitting next to you, what, what they use, because it's like this burglars, for example, they will always kind of choose the, um, the, the, the easiest target. And so um, it, it's always a, a, a sort of equation of you know, cost, organized crime also, and, 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 and so on. It's just also work like using the basic business principles, so they kind of have their cost structure and uh, they will always shoot the easiest targets. So we just don't want to be the easiest target in the food chain, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, maybe another very generic, uh, but uh, yeah, generic question. Uh, coming from uh, Vansal's comment about the shift from 60s to 70s from uh, utopian Star Trek to, to very black and white uh, Star Wars scenario uh, with this accent to uh, philosophers and writers as uh, filmmakers as Adam Curtis or Bifo Berardi saying that we are at the point of uh, no possible future. Uh, now we heard that uh, the vision of the future is very dark, of course it is. Uh, still, I would like to know, uh, for instance, in Trevor's work, uh, we have a certain description of a status quo. Uh, we have also a possible prediction through this machine vision, but still uh, there are not that many answers uh, in terms of uh, certain utopian thinking. Uh, is this somehow in the back side of your mind uh, working on this machine vision project, uh, kind of an idea of uh, of and of a possible future. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I elaborate on that. That's a question. I mean, I guess you know some of the things you said. You're talking about how we have this philosophy with basically lens of, of <laughs> like trying to you know my electricity plus you know communism or whatever like AI plus communism, which I don't believe in. I just can't. I, I can't believe it. I mean. Um, so, I, I think for me, with the machine learning project in particular, and that, that work, it's more to try to disrupt the form of, forms of common sense that are being built into machine learning networks and artificial intelligence infrastructures, because <clears throat> common sense is historical and common sense is specific to you know, the, the, that particular person. And what we're seeing you know, uh, a very kind of specific culture mm -hmm. of Silicon Valley white male engineers being generated, you know, being propagated throughout global infrastructures like those, mm -hmm. that, those particular kinds of values, which I think are really at odds with the most kinds of values that people have historically had, and certainly at odds with values of, you know, people that live in East Palo Alto who, you know, are poor and black, <laughs> you know? So, so I guess it's like for me that the, the, the bigger point just of that work is trying to destabilize what we think of as common sense. Like, so for example, with building AIs that only see interpretations of dreams or omens and portents, just reminding people that meanings are always situated and always historical and always, you know, in flux, right? And that there's nothing natural at all about any kind of taxonomy that you can build. Thanks. The next time, do you have something here? I guess, ah, oh, I have something in here. Um, I agree that, that uh, diversity 
uh, that you're searching for by putting Freud in machine learning is something appealing also in my project. But what I see in your project is something like an extra quality that brings some hope maybe because the question of utopia is ultimately about some hope. Um, it's actually that metaphysical level of um, um, following the infrastructure of power and data and everything and offering these, um, I don't know, contemplative images of uh, landscapes. <laughs> Something about putting it in that cosmic perspective and um, Something about that like works, uh, and the reason I like your work is actually this metaphysical um, perspective from above. Like all these issues we have with power and all these sad stories and desperation and detective work and all these forms suddenly become very quiet. Suddenly you see the sky there and you think, you know, in terms of eternity, what these humans are doing on the planet, it's kind of ridiculous. So I would add that maybe also adding to that a bit philosophy, metaphysics, or these like forgotten um, perspectives, how people try to find hope or move on with some new meanings are part of uh, some form of resistance. It is also that what I search for in my project. Just to like make make you more comfortable, I, I don't really buy into any anarcho techno communist oh, no, no, I just, ideas. I just, I just, I just yeah, saw, like, but so. of course I'm like using. But I, can I understand that that impulse? I mean, like yeah. I want to believe. Uh -huh. you know, Me too. Like, you know, but I don't. <laughs> yeah, but but why do I? Uh, why I can't really actually subscribe to all these theories? You know, at full <laughs> is because I don't believe in those big solutions uh, from certain reasons and. I, 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 w since the question was like what to do or w w what's the future, you know, uh, in terms of this, uh, I don't know, platform analysis, um, I, we can't predict future and we can't really say that philosophy may have some say in like, you know, doing future. Uh, we, we, we don't know what, what's going to happen. What, what, what we can do in respect to future is to at least trace the way it already happens today. And uh, again, through the concept of uh, agency, uh, we act and so do corporations and the, uh, you know, secret co agencies, we act upon our our horizon of, uh, of expectations and that's how the future the possible future is somehow materialized today and if we even like you know get that into our you know respect that we are already somehow you know dealing with future and maybe like this kind of philosophical cliche um, uh, answer but uh, just develop that one level further to uh, direction I didn't had the time to expose the, during the crazy presentation uh, even if we mm, uh, confront our worldview, and I mean like the, f the, the way we really feel at home in the world, the way we perceive this, you know, around to be real, and how the digital technologies affect that view. Because uh, for a long time we fought, uh, we had this random materialism, that means that we thought like this is it, you know, I can touch this, that's, that's the proof, that's the ultimate proof. And now we know it's simply incorrect, you know, because there's so much more to that. You, you can't really touch the cloud and things like that. And our... <laughs> Good for you. But anyway, like, you know, uh, uh, the very platforming the, the, and the, the, the experience with digital world can really affect the physical world. And that's what maybe we are steering up here. Do we have maybe some questions from the audience? I think I, uh, there is no coincidence that uh, if one tries to find some kind of solution to the
we understand the technology in other words, narratives of the system you are talking about. And we also mentioned Silicon Valley guys. And there is very specific ideology behind all this technology. Uh, the most kind of explicit concept is concept of singularity. And those guys are very much believing in, in this. Of course, there is very specific also culture around to, to those guys going back to the 60s and that. So, so these issues have to be addressed in a critical way. And, and, and so, for example, with extraction of data. Now, extraction of data is something what was for capitalism in the late 19th century extraction of natural resources. And you might remember what was the problem in, in, in the 19th century and early 20th century uh, with, with the Theodore Rousseau dissolving his big monopolies, big corporations. So now we are actually 100 years later in a very similar position because let's face it, data is power. And if power is concentrated in the hands of the few, there is not democracy. So we are moving more and more to not only to oligarchy, uh, but to new form of feudalism. So I, I, I would like to uh, ask you to think uh, about this very complex specific issue, because if we won't, then, then things are accelerating, moving very fast, and you can see how it's changing. And let me finish with this and uh, challenge you with one thing that you mentioned already. On one hand, you have this acceleration you mentioned too, right? Uh, so technology is developing ever faster. But the other side, laws, regulations, culture, it's on a much slower time. And you have this clash of temporalities. And, and so how we can think about it in terms of narratives, how we can machine really, I mean, don't think. We have to teach them how to think, right? Because it's not, it's the way you, you set it up, right? And how, the way you set it up, it's, it's not neutral, it's not innocent. There is always some kind of expectations, ideology, beliefs, right? And so, so this is, like, I think, very important task for artists, but also for technologies, activists, politicians, and, and so on. So, I, I think it, it, it would be very interesting to, to hear your comments in, in, in this direction. Thank you. Wow, there has been like uh, so many uh, topics. I would. Uh, I would pick on, uh, for instance, the narrative aspect. Uh, that is really of my interest. Uh, how to how to uh, analyze, how to see, how to reflect, how to create, how to develop narratives, narrations that are uh, apt, that are uh, able to convey uh, the world as we live in the world. Because uh, just a small detour, narrations such as you know TV series or myth mythology they are not just you know stories to be told but they are somehow making us at home in the world that means uh, they are explaining us how uh, how what's what's the reasonable action to take what's the good what's the evil how do we relate to the meta narrative of the world and the history and stuff like that so we we desperately need narration and that may be something that will tap us with on time or that will somehow merge this diverging uh, temporalities that you, you were speaking about. And uh, um, to be more specific, I'm so curious about uh, the current quality TV or sequential narrating because that, uh, I think there's something very interesting happening. So that see uh, that because the narration is not really creating some you know, uh, um, self-contained stories with a beginning and an end, with a resolution, with catharsis and the evil being punished by the good, but actually they are like uh, applying the sequential logic of the TV series far, in a far more clever way, like Best World, like Top of the Lake, uh, and all these uh, examples. 
Um, I'll just shortly say that for me, in this, uh, all these questions you ask, maybe the crucial question is responsibility. I see democracy possible only if we take better care of issues of responsibility, and by that I mean all these like emerging new technologies and risks that happen with that. We kind of outsourced all these decisions to Silicon Valley, or we, in some sense, we don't want to be involved with that, or we want to pretend this just comes out of nowhere, every new technology, and we just have to ad adapt. But what I'm attracted to in case of these uh, makerspace, hackerspace communities, I see groups of people that want to be part of that, like be involved with these emerging technologies and have direct access in terms of showing different scenarios, different uses of these technologies, but also taking personal responsibility. Once you start self-experimenting with different, like even uh, drugs or um, different like regimes of dieting or different technologies, you're taking an active, maybe too much individual responsibility. So I'm thinking, you know, maybe the crucial thing for that future that we imagine is more open or a bit more in like open is best I can do uh, is uh, how do we share risk and how do we take responsibility so it's not like just something that happens outside of us and by the way the minerals uh, that's a very close topic to me uh, that uh, extraction of minerals is actually still going on and it's much worse than it was when we talk about Congo and all these cell phones and coltan and uh, it's a much more ugly story <laughs> Right. Um, I'll probably comment on the, on the data issue. Um, and the, well, yeah, we keep hearing like uh, data is a new oil, data is kind of the new natural resource of the 21st century, and it's really dangerous how corporations have, you know, that monopolized um, you know, data sources, etc. Um, when I think about it, actually, in the um, you might have a, uh, ironically, you might have the exact opposite problem. In the sense, there's just uh, too much data. I mean, the human kind is kind of, you know, drowning in, in data today. And, um, and some of the data, or actually, or maybe most of the data, uh, is bogus. Or it's either, you know, somehow it became bogus, or it is intentionally being made bogus. Which I think is very, very dangerous. Like, I mean, the whole thing about fake news, which I'm, people can be civil to the term fake news, even though uh, probably not the concept, but uh, the, the, the practical implementation of fake news has become, has become very, uh, very approachable and very, very easy uh, for many. Um, but I kind of worry that, um, again, as we kind of progress and the internet becomes really, again, it keeps saying the, the oxygen. Um, then, um, you know, the concept of fake news is basically modifying uh, the, the data that people have uh, access to and you know, modifying in a very smart and very thoughtful way, uh, which is to manipulate those people and kind of make them, you really, really think, but when, when you have, you know, this matrix concept where you are really kind of consuming some kind of reality that is being modified by someone intentionally with any kind of interest, that's how I think a much bigger problem than corporations monopolizing the data. I kind of worry that uh, we uh, one day we'll wake up in a world where uh, the whole reality that we see around us is basically somehow influenced. It's, it's not the reality that you know um, uh, somehow powers this this world or this universe. But it's something that was engineered and fabricated by some quote architect that has some you know, different interests, uh, and that I hate that. I, I don't want that. No. Some more questions from the audience.
Maybe I'll try just something that always surprises me when I sometimes read that uh, rules under which I release my data to different companies. I could never find one thing which is quite crucial for me. Uh, do they have a, like a crisis plan? What would they do with the data in case someone takes over the country or uh, evil aliens land and take over the servers? And by that I mean the simple historical experience of the Dutch Jewish community that uh, back in the early 20th century basically willingly submitted their data about their religious affiliation and so on in a census, which was seen as a very neutral thing to do in the early 20th century. And then something like 20 years after this evil power, the Nazis come, and they use the census data basically to find the Jews and uh, send them to the concentration camps. So if we had this historical experience, why we don't have any policies in terms of destroying the data in case of such like crisis scenarios. I just don't see any crisis scenario, or maybe that's a question for you, Andre. Do you have a crisis scenario in your company, or do you even imagine something like that? I don't think so. <laughs> no, but I mean, it brings up a really good, uh, the, it brings up a really good point, which, is what, which actually has to do with time as well, right? In, in the sense that, like, what is... I had an interesting conversation with a guy who's a friend of mine who's a very famous cryptographer, a guy named Dan Bernstein. He wrote most of the primitives that are used in, in, in cryptography. And I asked him what he was working on, and he said he's working on post-quantum computing cryptography, and he wants to implement it next year, right? And so what that is is that he's... There's a kind of theoretical computer called a quantum computer that if it's possible to build a quantum computer, we know that this theoretical computer will be able to um, crack all of the encryption that is currently used, in, in use, right? And so he wanted to develop encryption mechanisms that would be able to defeat those computers. And they said, well, why do you want to do that and implement it now? Because nobody even knows if it's possible to build actually a quantum computer. And he said, well, because you ha we have to protect ourselves from the future, because we're at a moment in time where data is collected and you don't, and it's so cheap to store that it's just cumulative, right? So there's a, a constant accumulation of data over time. And so you have to start thinking about the, po the various possibilities in the future as being an adversary, just as much as you think about a Russian hacker or whatever it is as being an adversary. And so I think that that's a, a way of thinking that we're not used to, that you pointed out very beautifully in terms of thinking about you know, these databases of ruin or whatever, I mean, what do you want to call them there, I think. Something else? If I can, one more, <laughs> nobody is asking. <laughs> the issue of the social bubbles, which is very much related to our worry, utilization of everything. And we, we see this optimization everywhere. And, and it, it tends to kind of lead to reproduction and uh, then creating both cognitive and social fragmentation. And what we see today is exactly the result if we talk about some uh, root causes. Uh, and, and there is no coincidence that Obama in his fireball speech was talking about social bubbles uh, and of course Trump drags it uh, they have to do a lot with it. So, so I am very curious where you have been thinking about this issue of 
fragmentations, social progress now, digitization, algorithmization, AI, all, all that is contributing. That's another like uh, almost traditional topic uh, tied up to all these uh, digital technologies, social networks, platforming, and uh, uh, how to how to face this uh, echo chambers created by social uh, social media. Uh, I think maybe even resorting to Franco before Berardi, we need to like reinvent the language, or the, that means the usage of those platforms. What we actually do on our timeline, or what do we post on our uh, Twitter account, and in the way that it is going to be like intersectional, that, that the medium is going to be integrative and not fragmentational. And that's of course like the how to do that. How, what's the riddle? And uh, I would say that maybe even the very preoccupation with the basic problems, like mainly the future, uh, may be uh, the, uh, that may be the point of concern for basically anyone. If we really, um, uh, if we really reinvent our language, and like sp speaking about or coming from, let's say, academia, although I hate that. Uh, we in a, in, a, in academia we uh, sort of accelerated this process to uh, like utmost absurdity that for instance now uh, more than half of the articles that are published by academics they are not read by a single person other than the reviewers of the journals you know and so so there has been like this explosion of discourses explosion of theory explosion of like all sorts of researches and it all, all so somehow matches you know this uh, or it's analogous to all those uh, data accelerations but uh, and like speaking about academia we just simply need to get to back to the point you know to really address the issues that are at stake to make use of the language we use so uh, Franco before before uh, Berardi he calls it uh, erotics of language so that we we try uh, he tries to reinvent poetry for the 21st century that means how to make language seductive enough so that we actually talk about meaningful things and not like cute cats Actually, that question of fragmentation and all these uh, algorithms on Facebook that feed you the same type of uh, things you like to read and so on, um, I, I think maybe we, should, we are asking the wrong question. Um, basically, from Aristotle, as we know, that any type of uh, democratic society is based on diversity. He says you don't want to have uh, the community being, becoming a family. So what, what the problem is that we have a low tolerance for that type of diversity. We don't talk to people that don't share our language and uh, there are not spaces. We are also divided this urban and village population. Like when you see who votes for who, it's pretty obvious. So I think maybe our lack of um, tolerating diversity is more to blame and I'm not certain how could that be, like I hang out with some communities that have elements of that reaching out, like when I think about the makers and even Maker Fair, which is a problematic event in its own way, but what I find fascinating about these places is that all people like to tinker, so there are activities maybe that we don't see, like Maker Fair for me is a very democratic even if it has some other issues, a very democratic format where I see people uh, with all kinds of political ideas and reasons why they do tinkering and making of some bizarre machines or uh, making, repairing something, making cheaper toys or whatever. So maybe we, we just need to create more spaces or opportunities and tolerate it. Okay, I will never convince you not to vote that guy, but you know, we can reach an agreement that we probably want the institutions of law to be independent or um, this way. This is moving a bit. Okay, any last question? Um, just a short question, which is um, sounding easy, but to me it's a big question. Um, I really wonder 
it is seriously possible to recreate creativity or more intuition because there was a story with the go game which was recreated I think it's more an algorithm which is quite complicated but I seriously think it's just not possible it's the only left thing that can save us in the high AI or in the problems that we make for us or need for us and I think it's just not possible to reprogram or recreate true intuition from a human way. What do you think? No, I, I totally agree. I mean, precisely be absolutely. But but that doesn't mean that it isn't going to happen. <laughs> right? I mean, so that, I mean, so this is the problem is precisely that, you know, like if you're building a platform, you are always assigning meanings to images, right? Like that, like basic object recognition in AI. Like, this is a microphone, this is a fucking magazine, whatever, right? But that's actually not how people see, right? I mean, physiologically, maybe you see shapes and stuff like that, but when we see, when, like, let's imagine we're at its night and we're walking through a park. I'm going to see something completely different than, than what you're going to see. I'm a man, you're a woman, right? What is your ethnicity? You're going to see something different than me. Where are we in the world? What is our class position? All of these things completely affect the means that we create. So the, the, the thing that you're pointing out, that people have different intuitions and that that's not reproducible, is precisely the kind of thing that an AI system cannot do, right? It can only see what it's been trained to see, or it's only, it can detect patterns in data. So, like, even AI is stupid, where we should just say linear algebra, that's what it is, right? <laughs> Pattern recognition, something like that, statistics, right? And that's, that, what's that? Now. Now, no, but I think that, that I, I don't, I don't, and that's a bigger conversation, I don't believe that this artificial general kind of stuff. But the, but the point is that logics are programmed into any kind of platform and they can only reproduce those kind of logics, right? And that humans are much more flexible than that and that allows us to do certain kinds of things. However, when humans are put into structures that are very rigid, we tend to conform to them, right? And so I guess that is my fear of, that's my real fear of like the totalitarian AI is the kind of establishment of very rigid rules for the society that are kind of enforced by you know smart platforms and cities or something like that it has the effect of um, really producing a much more kind of conformed society with much less practical freedoms than perhaps we have now. I'm like skeptical about the question uh, in general as well, but um, I'm <clears throat> not only skeptical about the current development, but even uh, about the very perspective that uh, is pre-stipulated in this question. Because it's, you ask whether this kind of in intuition that is somehow is here, has some kind of essence and is bound to humans, is going to be recreated somewhere, let's say, in future in technology. But maybe there's not, like, maybe intuition is not human, you know, maybe, maybe there's not such a stable or static thing like intuition. Maybe the, the answer, without the question, is that we will reimagine our own, you know, imagination and intuition, even in respect to technology. But that's like a philosophical trick, not to answer the question, but to, to turn the perspective around. I, 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 would, I actually want to add to that because you said something really nice and it is this idea that imagination is not something static, is that we always define the same way. When you think, you know, I don't know when, like when you read the Bible, so this thing we call intuition is like some dream God sends you and tells you what to do. So for a long time we thought there was some big AI, <laughs> some architect in the background giving you the intuition. And then through romanticism, we get into this idea that we have this inner source of infinite creativity and that inner uniqueness in individuality is what gives you that unique type of uh, uh, pattern recognition or idea. So it's a pretty recent idea that there is some very individualistic interpretation of the world or whatever. 
So we actually don't know what would be some next level um, definition and um, idea of, of, about the intuition. But uh, just to add something about this AI, um, what, why we don't like the AI is because we don't like the statistics. We don't like this idea that statistically it will determine what is possible to see or how you should interpret some data or shapes. And we forget in that process that the whole idea of statistics and probability is incredibly creative hack that happens sometimes when we need like um, theory of relativity, we need like some way to describe the behavior of subatomic particles and, and you know some very complex also events in in society because it all starts sometimes when people but when I read these um, books like um, the idea of statistics comes in a period when uh, people were, uh, were uh, looking into research about suicides so they found that there is a certain pattern in different cities in Europe how many people will commit suicides and that started sociology and that started also this idea that we can kind of manage communities but we could take something from that early um, involvement with subatomic particles or these new ways of thinking about social phenomena and that we forgot and maybe we just need to remind ourselves that new maths and new ways of structuring reality always bring new forms of creativity not just new more forms of control yeah no but the difference is like you're you're talking about applications that are outside of a kind of neoliberal logic right i mean so you're, the examples you're pointing to are examples of a, of a kind of classically liberal society where like we're going to have this sector of society that we're going to like enforce in such a way that it can't that it won't be part of the market and we're going to have another section section of the society that is right and so i think that's a conversation that we need to revisit because I, Obviously, there's places where like machine learning is incredibly helpful, like energy efficiency, you know, like in, you know, like mitigating environmental footprints and things like that. these are all things that AI can do a lot better than humans can do, and that will produce outcomes that we want. But but I think the question, the the underlying thing that you're proposing, I think, which is I think right, is that kind of having a larger conversation about what sectors of society do we want to optimize and which ones do we deliberately not want to optimize. So like, you know, you could optimize, you know, health insurance rates that would fluctuate from minute to minute based on whether what you're eating, but maybe we don't want to do that. <laughs> and I think that those are the kinds of conversations that are going to have to be had. The concept of singularity and when you know AI meets humans and uh, kind of fully you know replaces the human brain and, and whatnot. Uh, but first of all, I would say I think we are very far from that point. Uh, like in the state of the art, you know, we talk about AI today as a against a mathematical uh, term. Most of the frameworks that we use today and that brought these huge innovations in you know image recognition nature, speech processing, cybersecurity, etc. These frameworks were actually created in the 70s or 80s. Uh, it's only that, okay, you know, if, uh, maybe it's cheaper to store data, it's kind of the capacity of the computers today enables use of these frameworks, but it's not like it's something, you know, totally new and uh, they don't like it, but it's, um, it's actually been with us for 30, 40 years. And uh, you know, what's interesting is that uh, if you look at uh, how the pioneers of AI, like Alan Turing and Clark Shannon in the 40s, uh, defined uh, the singularity that is uh, what was the ultimate test, whether the uh, machine beat humans. Uh, they actually have a name multiple of first version, but uh, one of the kind of one that, that, that they somehow agreed on was it will be the moment where a machine beats the human being in the game of chess. <laughs> and uh, you know what happened? Like in 1997, we got a world grandmaster, Barry Kasparov, being beaten by Deep Blue. And it wasn't really AI at all. Like Deep Blue was uh, just a giant, it was a brute force. It didn't do anything like that. It would even fit the mathematical framework of AI. It was just a total. And, and so it's like Turing was wrong in this regard, Shannon was wrong, 
But I think I mean, if you ask about um, whether machine will be ever able to kind of you know beat intuition or somehow replicate the human intuition, it feels to me like um, uh, it's really hard to define that in the first place. How do we measure it? Like, I mean, when will you be able to say, okay, today there is this milestone in human time because this is the first time in history where the machine started, you know, having the intuition. And, and I think like. I, I think if something we will see, uh, you know, machines sort of in, in this way. I'm actually not a, not a fatalist whatsoever. I think that uh, the way it will continue is more like uh, you know the, the AI frameworks and the, uh, the the stuff that being created will really be more like an extension of the human brain set instead of replacement. I don't worry that. Of course, I mean, in the next decade, people will be millions of people will lose jobs to AI. That's uh, totally uh, that's that's totally sure in my view. But I mean, same happened in the you know 19th century and 20th century because of the automation and reform and whatnot. And that's fine. I, I don't have a problem with that whatsoever. Uh, I think that um, you know uh, that uh, you know dark you know Skynet uh, or Matrix kind of vision of AI. As an embodiment of something that somehow replaces the human race, uh, isn't really the subject uh, for the foreseeable future in centuries and thousands of years. I don't, I don't see that happening. So I think our time is up, and we ended up on a relatively optimistic note. So <laughs> thanks a lot to all of you for participating, thanks a lot to our hosts and obviously to the audience. So, have a nice evening.